Hey, Nothing is Wasted family. Are you walking through a specific valley looking for resources to help you in your pain? I think we can all attest to the fact that there is comfort in hearing from those who have walked a similar path and have found hope and healing on the other side. That is why we have created collections of resources called Curated Pathways to help you navigate your specific pain point. With Curated Pathways on topics like grief, child loss, sexual betrayal, childhood trauma, widowhood, and more, we've compiled the very best resources from Nothing Is Wasted all in one place that will speak directly to what you are experiencing right now. Our Curated Pathways will give you access to everything we've created from past podcast episodes to bonus content and our masterclasses, live coaching, and everything in between. When you're facing a crisis, loss, or trauma, you don't have the time or energy to search for what could help you heal. You can get a taste of what our curated pathways have to offer by going to nothingiswasted.com slash pathways. But if you're ready to go to the next level on your healing journey, you can access the full library of our resources, including the entire curated pathway you're looking for by becoming a Community Plus member. For just $20 a month or $200 a year, you'll have access to the complete collection of Nothing Is Wasted's curated pathways. As a Community Plus member, you'll be able to access a new curated pathway each month as our collection grows. Our team has been working very hard on this to catalog, index, organize, and distribute our library of content in a way that will be most helpful to you. We know what it is like to face pain, and we want to equip you with the tools you need to find hope and healing as you move from pain to purpose. Join Community Plus today at nothingiswasted.com slash Community Plus and partner with God to take back your story. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Nothing Is Wasted podcast. My name is Aubrey Sampson, and I am one of your hosts. So excited to introduce this episode for you because Davey and I got to sit down with Pastor John Mark Comer. If you don't know who he is, he was the pastor at Bridgetown Church in the Pacific Northwest for a long time. He has a ministry called Practicing the Way, which is essentially equipping, empowering, teaching pastors and ministry leaders in spiritual practices and in leading their communities in spiritual practices and some of the more contemplative ways of following Jesus. He's the author of a lot of books, including The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, Garden City, and a new book that I believe is actually just called Practicing the Way. But I know you're going to love our conversation with him. I'll, I'll join you again at the end to unpack this concept that he's going to talk about with us, the dark night of the soul, because it's something that I've actually been studying, researching, writing on for over a year from my next book that's coming out. Um, but it's actually something I've been living. And I won't, I won't take too much time here, but John Mark Homer will talk about how we – we tend to use the phrase the dark night of the soul incorrectly in our kind of current vernacular. We lump it in with uh, just like a hard season, depression, darkness. Um, and there might be some overlap, but that's not technically what the dark night of the soul is. The dark night of the soul is a phrase coined in the 16th century by St. John of the Cross and his mentor and spiritual mama, Teresa of Avila. And what it essentially is describing is seasons spiritually when God seems to remove his presence from you or a sense of his presence from us. And what we know from scripture is that God actually never leaves us nor forsakes us. So he never actually removes that presence. But what he does is very intentionally removes a sense of his presence for a number of reasons, which John Mark Comer will unpack. And I'll talk about on the other side of this episode as well. But One of those reasons is that so that we begin worshiping God for God's sake alone and not God for a feeling, right? We're invited to walk by faith, not by feeling. And that's especially in seasons of trauma, tragedy, and major life transition. That's what the dark night of the soul is all about. It's not talked about very often. And so I am so thrilled for you to hear from Pastor John Mike Comer because I've learned a lot from him on this topic and, you know, from others as I've been studying and researching as well. Hey, it is the new year. We are well in our way to 2024. And we want to invite you to take a next step. Take a next step in your healing. Take a next step in your relationship with God. Take a next step here at Nothing Is Wasted. If you are ready to take back your story, if you are ready to experience more transformation, more um, comfort in the midst of your heartache, 
We would love to invite you to join us for a free live call with Davey. It's for five steps to taking back your story. And you sign up by simply going to our website, nothingiswasted.com slash start here. Again, that's nothingiswasted.com slash start here. With that, let's go ahead and take a listen to my conversation and Davey's conversation with Pastor John Mark Comer. Well, John Mark, so good to have you on the Nothing Is Wasted podcast. Thanks for joining us, man. Thank you, Davey and Aubrey. Very happy to be with you. Well, we're honored. I, I would love, you know, I know a lot of people are going to be familiar with, with you and yeah. some of the stuff that you've written. And I mean, especially Ruthless Elim- Elimination of Hurry was, has been so instrumental for us as a family. I know f- we talk about it a lot of, as a ministry. So one, it's an honor to have you on to actually hear from you personally about it. But uh, even though there's some people who may not be familiar with you, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, just just a little context for your yeah. life. And then we'll, we'll dive into some of these topics of conversation. I think are really instrumental in helping people heal and suffering. Of course. No. Well, the honor is mine. Yeah. My name is John Mark Comer, born and raised in California, but spent the last 20 or so years church planting and pastoring Bridgetown church in Portland, Oregon and uh, really focusing in the the latter part of that on teaching and writing, and then um, stepped away from that for all good reasons about a year and a half ago to found a nonprofit called Practicing the Way that is working to integrate the best learnings of the spiritual formation movement into how discipleship is done in Western churches. Hmm. And then recently moved back to California, and we now live in Topanga Canyon in L.A. And yeah. uh, I will discipline myself not to talk about the weather since you're in Chicago, Aubrey. You know? And, <laughs> I know. I'm um, disciplining my yeah. heart not to be jealous right now. <laughs> that, that's it. We have three teenagers. Um, my wife and I have been uh, uh, married for 22, coming up on 23 years. Nice. And uh, last little nitnoid is I love the title of your podcast. So I mm. pray a morning <laughs> liturgy, not every morning, but at least every Monday to start my week. And then depending on how the week goes, mm. once or twice more, that just kind of captures my whole heart. And the end of the, that I kind of wrote myself. And the end of the prayer or the liturgy is um, whatever comes today, help me to greatly receive to gratefully receive the good as a gift for your hand from your hand and to suffer lovingly all the rest because mm. nothing is wasted. Come and on. You will make everything beautiful in its time mm. if I only surrender to your will and embrace mm. this moment as it is. Wow. So wow. when I saw I fast. love that phrase, yeah, nothing is wasted. Um, Mm. a therapist gave it to Mm. me a few years ago and it was a deeply healing way for me to think about some experiences in my past and present that just feel like pain, you know? Mm. So Mm. anyway, thank you for what you do. Wow. Yeah. Thank you for that. We need, we need a copy of that. I like the suffer lovingly that stood out to me. That was was something. Yeah. That's from, uh, Jean-Pierre de Cassade. Mm-hmm. who wrote a beautiful book um, called Abandonment to Divine Providence. I think 16th century, you'd have to Google the era, French Jesuit, um, beautiful book. And he has a line in there about suffering lovingly. Oh, and I yeah. just thought, what a, what a phrase, you know? Yeah, that's wow. that's really wow. something there, isn't there? <laughs> okay, so in context, uh, I'm, this is, I'm writing about, I use this quote, writing about, how we grow and mature and Mm. this concept, ancient Christian concept of active spirituality and passive spirituality. Mm. I was just reading about Uh, this from St. John and Teresa. Yes. Yes. St. John, Teresa. Yes. No, that's where I originally found it, but there's a running stream and they don't mean passive in a bad, like we kind of use passive, like passive aggressive or a lazy passive. Mm -hmm. They mean it in a positive way. So by active spirit. Yes. What God is doing. Yep. So active spirituality is things where it feels the psychological language, not theological language, but mm. where it feels like we are the ones who do it. So it's spiritual disciplines, reading your Bible in the morning, going to church, learning the Bible, passive spirituality is where it feels like God or life or the evil one or suffering. 
is doing it to you. And our job is just to welcome and open to God in it rather than mm. rebel and resist. Mm. And they have this whole paradigm where we mature through a mix of both active spirituality, practicing the disciplines, going yeah. to church, doing the things, yeah. learning, listening to podcasts, and basically just welcoming suffering and letting God work through it. Anyway, wow. here's, here's a quote. He uses the same language. This is a translation to English, but would to God that all men could know how very easy it would be for them to arrive at a high degree of sanctity, by meaning like high degree of spiritual maturity. They would only have to fulfill the simple duties of Christianity and of their state of life to embrace with submission the crosses belonging to that state mm. and to submit with faith and love to the designs of providence. Mm. The passive part of sanctity or what we would call spiritual formation is still more easy. It's even easier since it only consists in accepting that which we very often have no power to prevent oh. and <laughs> in suffering lovingly. That is to say, Beautiful. with sweetness and consolation, mm. those things that too often cause weariness and disgust. Once more, I repeat, in this consists sanctity. Dang. Wow. wow. Beautiful line. Wow. Cassad yeah. for the win. Yeah. Wow. Sweetness mm. and consolation. Mm. I, I, I love, love that. I don't, only in accepting the things that we can't prevent anyway. But it's right. amazing how we right. we rage against the things that are mm. far beyond our control to mm. prevent or predict. That concept of active and passive, not necessarily as opponents of each other, but at working in tandem with each other. No, two pieces that's such, of a, apart. that's such a novel. I mean, I'm, I don't think I've ever heard it put that way, but it, it absolutely appropriately describes the way God shapes us. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And well, it ties you know, in a lot, a lot of the of... work that you guys do. Mm -hmm. Well, and I was going to say the same thing. I mean, mo most of your work, John Mark is, is talking about this idea of this journey of spiritual formation and you see it uniquely. You see it differently than what a lot of times we're going to get with some of our modern authors that, you know, it just, you've had, you've got a unique way of, of describing things, putting things and seeing things that make us all have some paradigm shifts. You know, that's why I think your stuff has really been very accessible for people. Can you describe to me what, what, do you, how do you see for spiritual formation? Like what, what exactly, how would you define that? What does that look like for you? You may have already done it with just that active versus passive, but expound on that a little bit. Yeah, good question. Yeah, I mean, spiritual formation may be new language to some listening, and at different followers of Jesus at different points in church history have used different language to talk about the process of discipleship. And that's all spiritual formation is. It's mm. just the lifelong process of discipleship. So ancient Christians called it theosis. We don't use that language anymore because uh, in Greek, you know, it's theos is the word for God. And the most literal translations into English would either be divinization or godification, which mm -hmm. sounds way too Hindu yeah. for kind of modern Western Christians. Yeah. So we don't use that language anymore. We actually use that language all the time. We use the word godly, but it doesn't, for whatever reason, the word godly doesn't ping people's same. fear. Yeah, but think about the word. The, the word godly is the word, the noun God as an adverb. So mm -hmm. godly means if you if we say, oh, she's a godly woman, he's a godly man, mm -hmm. we are saying they are a godlike person. Um, yeah. They're godlike or they yeah. are like God. That's what godly means. So ancient Christians called it godification, theosis, which they referred to as the process of becoming more like God through union with God. Union is mm -hmm. the language they would have used, participation mm -hmm. in the inner life of the Trinity. So um, I grew up in a tradition that called it sanctification, right. which is a, a, a Bible word, but actually we used it in a non-Bible way. Um, so that was kind of an odd thing we did, but we called it sanctification. The holiness movement called it holiness. So there, I mean, there are different, people are just grasping for the lifelong process of discipleship. Spiritual mm -hmm. formation, whenever I teach on it, I always, this is a little, my unique thing, you can agree or disagree. But I like to say that 
spiritual formation is not a Christian thing or even a religious thing. It's a human thing. So mm -hmm. I kind of separate out spiritual formation in the way of Jesus from spiritual formation in general. So okay. spiritual formation in general is just the process by which your spirit and all that we mean by that is your inner woman or inner man uh, synonym would be something like your heart or your character or the shape of your life. So we're not talking personality, we're talking character, development of your person. Mm. Um, spiritual formation is the process by which your spirit or your inner woman or inner man is formed into a particular shape or a character. Now it may be a beautiful shape or it may be a monstrous shape. Mm. So sometimes people will say to me that they are getting into spiritual formation. And I know what people mean. They almost always mean they're reading books by Dallas Willard or Richard Foster yeah, or myself right. or Ruth Ailey Barton, or they are starting to practice more contemplative spiritual disciplines like right. silence or Lectio Divina or contemplative right. prayer. Maybe they are in therapy and kind of working through inner stuff. I love it. I'm a thousand percent for all that stuff. But I, I like to chide if I have the relational equity with the person um, and just say, listen, you have been into spiritual formation since you were in utero before you came out of your mother's <laughs> womb. You right, were right. by virtue of who your mom was and what time in history you were born and mm. what her emotional state was like when she was pregnant mm. with you and whether or not you had a dad in the picture. You have been being spiritually formed since mm. before you took your first breath. You know, there's a That's the good. nature versus nurture debate, which scientists have basically disbanded because it's both like we from our earliest yeah. days, we are formed. And so spiritual formation in the way of Jesus is the process by which we are formed by our inner spirit or woman or man is formed into Christ-like character or into a person of love through union with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So in other words, it's a life of discipleship yeah. to Jesus. Yeah, that's good. I'm interested, Denmark, especially for our, our particular listeners that are in pain, some of them certainly are practicing spiritual practices, like you were just kind of mentioning, walking through maybe, you know, some of Sabbath or silence or what have you. But for the, for the person who's in pain, I guess I'm wondering, like this spiritual formation in the way of Jesus, what does it look like? Yeah, I mean, this will be old information to all of you, but the New Testament writers, beginning with Jesus, are adamant that pain and suffering are the crucible of transformation, you know? Not that you can't grow and mature theoretically without pain and suffering, but I've yet to meet anyone at a high level of maturity, who is deeply joyful and grateful and free of the ego and living in peace, who has not been through long, yeah. hard seasons yeah. of pain and suffering. Yeah. Yeah. And i um, been working lately with the work of Todd Hall, who's a psychologist out of Rosemead, who's trying to empirically study spiritual formation. What can we actually test and say this mm -hmm. is effective for growth? Mm -hmm. And he basically says there are three, three kind of pathways that we know these three things produce a high level of change in people. One is basically mm -hmm. contemplative prayer in the broad sense of forms of quiet processing with God. I'd love to come back to that because I think lots of implications for seasons of pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. The other is deep interpersonal relationships where, you know, not us at a church gathering with hundreds of people, as beautiful as it is, but us and the one, two, three, four that we can bear our souls to over a long period of time. And three is suffering because suffering, you know, disrupts the, the homeostasis that we live at, not just in our body, but in our mind and our heart. And um, that disruption, because our homeostasis, like the, the baseline level that we've kind of come to, this is who we are, this is how we are with God, this is how we are in relationship to other people, in relationship to money, planning, our career, that's all, as you two know, blown apart yeah. by yeah. tragedy, experience, suffering. Right. And that is terrifying and heartbreaking and demonic at times. 
but it also comes with the chance for a new normal to be reintroduced and changes to take place in us yeah. and outside of us that we would never open to as we were clinging to our status quo. So sure. suffering is deeply transformational. And I think there's good news, you know, um, t by way of tangent, there's a little book I love called Domestic Monastery by Ronald Rollheiser. Have either of you read that? Mm. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Beautiful little Writing book. It you, can read right it, now, though. you can read it in 30 minutes. Nice. And it's basically about spiritual formation for young parents. And he's writing about, you'd have to read it, writing about how parenting little kids can be like your monastic life. Beautiful, short, and it's blissfully short, which is perfect for young parents. Yeah. But he tells the story <laughs> of this Italian monk who was famous. I forget his name. But this Italian monk who was a hermit for 30 years went off into not just a monastery, into a hermitage. And basically wow. spent three decades mostly in solitude and prayer. Mm -hmm. And he came back and he visited with his mom, who was an Italian mother who had had six children and had spent the last 30 years having and raising six children. Wow. And he realized that his mother was both more loving than he was and more mm. contemplative than he was. Wow. And, <laughs> and wow. he had gone into a hermitage for 30 years and she'd just been changing diapers and raised, dropping kids off at school and making spaghetti for mm. dinner or whatever Italian mothers mm. did in that era. And wow. he just talks about how if you approach parenting in, in a certain way, it can have the same or even a greater effect than a, a monkish or a nunnish life would have wow. on your spiritual formation. Wow. wow. And I, I think yeah, to I bring it that. now back to, yes, I think absolutely. And I think to bring it back to this topic, I think I have a lot to say about practices and spiritual disciplines and slowing down and reorganizing your life around a rule of life. And I, I'm very for all of that. But times of suffering, when if you read one psalm that day, if you, right. if you manage to just barely pray Psalm 23, and that's all you can do because yeah. you're in survival yeah. mode, trauma yeah. mode, exhaustion yeah. mode. Yeah. Um, if you, not inevitably, you, you know this better than I, the same experience of suffering or trauma can ruin a soul just as easily as it can turn a soul into a saint. Yeah. So much of it's about our response and whether or not mm -hmm. we have community with us or not. Mm -hmm. And um, I think an experience of suffering, if we respond to it prayerfully and communally, meaning in, in relationship, it can have far more of a formative effect on us than practicing dozens of spiritual disciplines wow. with wow. extraordinary, you know, wow. Uh, mm -hmm. intentionality. And again, I'm for all of that stuff. Of course. But in those seasons of suffering, often our, our disciplined life goes away and we're just in survival mode, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. But God, God can meet us there and, and do even greater work through that. Good you know, here, John, mm. with that, kind of bringing back that like active versus passive into what you just said, mm -hmm. would you prescribe trying to drive back toward those contemplative practices. When you find your life has been completely upended with some kind of a tragedy, you're in crisis mode, you're in survival mode because of suffering that's taken place. Would you say it, it would be prescriptive to say, Hey, try to drive back to those contemplative practices as best as you can. Cause that's the fertile soil that, Jesus does a lot of his, you know, downloading onto, you know, and really like bringing some paradigm shifts to you or how, how would you say those two would interplay then in terms of, you yeah. know, obviously if life's kind of normal, whatever that means, right. It's like, here's your spiritual discipline, spiritual rhythms, as we like to call them. I know you call them that as well. Yeah, no. When that but... suffering hits, do we have like a means for, is it just a, well, you know what, I just got to wait till life kind of gets back into normal or is it prescriptive to say, Hey, try to keep moving in that direction. Even when life is crazy. What are your thoughts on that? John Mark? Mm. Hey guys, wanted to share something really cool with you. We've been launching our pain to purpose course in churches all over the world now. 
And it's been amazing to see how many people are finding hope and healing in the midst of their trauma through this course being offered at their local church. First of all, I just wanna celebrate that. We're bringing healing conversations back into the church. Secondly, I wanted to let you know how you can partner with us to get the course launched at your church. I know most of you listening may not be a pastor or a church leader, but chances are you know one. And what you may not know is how overwhelming it can be for pastors to walk with so many people through pain and trauma in their church. Now, the reality is most pastors feel ill-equipped for the task of helping navigate the difficult stories and tragedies that many of their congregants are facing. And we're passionate about helping churches feel equipped and engaging pain and trauma, which ultimately leads to transformation and healing, not just for the church, but for the surrounding community. So if you're a pastor, I wanna invite you to join me and our local church director, Ken Roberts, on a Zoom call that we hold twice a month just for pastors and church leaders. And if you know a pastor, which is probably most of you guys watching this, we, we'd love for you to get this information in their hands. This interactive Zoom call will give you the opportunity to hear from other pastors um, on how the Pain to Purpose course has positively impacted their churches. We'll give you the resources and tools that will lighten the load of your church staff and we'll show you how we'd love to help you as you're helping the people within your congregation heal. Because we're passionate about the same thing that you are, people moving through their pain and stepping into mission in their local church and community. So if you're not a pastor, why not share this incredible opportunity with your pastor? Let your pastor know about this call so they can learn more about the ways Nothing Is Wasted wants to partner with them in bringing hope and healing to your church. To sign up for the next Zoom call, just go to nothingiswasted.com slash pastors. The link will be below this and will be on all of the podcast platforms in their show notes. There you can choose a date to join us whenever it's most convenient for you. If you're not a pastor, this link is an easy one to send to your local church leaders with a little note about how Nothing Is Wasted has personally impacted your own healing journey. Now, as someone who has served as a pastor and as someone who has walked through unimaginable trauma, I know that a key part of revival within the body of Christ is gonna come from how we as the church step into pain and trauma with those who are hurting. Let me help you find a clear, proven path with ready-made tools and resources for your church body. Pastors, I really feel like this Zoom call is exactly what you've been looking for in serving your church more effectively in their pain. Sign up today, nothingiswasted.com slash pastors, or share that link with a pastor in your life, and let's partner with God in helping others move from pain to purpose. Yeah, I mean, likely what you would expect. There's no one-size-fits-all formula you know and so a lot of this will depend on are you an introvert or an extrovert do you have two little children or are you 59 and an empty nester but i think as a general rule the two places i would strongly encourage people to move toward would be um certain first certain contemplative practices that are less about doing and more about not doing and that feel less like work and more like rest. So I would not, you know, Great. say, hey, now is the time to like take a class from the Bible Project and master the book of <laughs> Hebrews and read these yeah. 19 books and maybe go get a certificate. None of that kind of stuff or, you know, go through this in-depth, you know, discipleship course. Yeah. It would be more yeah. disciplines like Sabbath and silence and contemplative prayer that even fasting that are disciplines of not doing that slow you down. I mean, you know, I'll know this, but the emotions that God built into our body and nervous system are designed to move our body emotion. They're designed to yeah. motion to make us move in a certain direction. Yeah. So feelings of anger, of course, are designed to speed us up, uh, which is why it's so hard to be patient in a argument with your wife or your child or whatever, because anger <laughs> speeds you up to go get out of the way of the falling avalanche or fight the saber toothed tiger. <laughs> Whereas sadness is designed to slow us down. You notice when you're in grief, you can barely think and your brain is fuzzy totally. and somebody asks you a question, what do you have for breakfast? And it takes you a minute to remember yeah. your, your whole body is trying to slow you down. So I think you certainly should not be trying to speed yourself up, which is what most Christians do through busyness and distraction. 
and what well you know john wellwood called spiritual bypassing trying to skip over the pain you need to slow down but what that means is in those kind of I think about it as make these disciplines is like making space, Sabbath, silence. These are making space, but not just for God. They're also making space for your own pain and suffering. So that's why so many people avoid them. You know, Thomas Keating, who's written some very helpful little things about contemplative life, uh, basically argues that when you first come to quiet before God, um, the first thing that comes up is what he called the unloading of the unconscious, meaning mm -hmm. in his paradigm, it's like all the undigested emotional trauma that is in your body from some horrific thing that happened to you when you were a seven-year-old little girl to a passing slight from a coworker a few hours, you know, the day before, whatever, all the undigested emotional pain that's in us that we push down through busyness and Netflix and workaholism yeah, and getting yeah. dinner ready on the table and changing, doing our laundry. It, it come when you just sit there before God in prayer or silence or rest, it comes up, which is why a lot of people go into Sabbath or into silence or into contemplative prayer thinking they're just going to feel joy and peace. Right. And over the course of a life, you will feel far more joyful and peaceful and in those spaces will be profoundly joyful and peaceful. But often, especially early on, and certainly in times of pain and suffering, um, you're going to feel worse, not better. Mm -hmm. But it's like it's mm -hmm. like your body, like when I go and we have a sauna, when I go into the sauna, my body sweats out all of the toxins. Yeah. It's like your body discharging this emotional toxicity that's in you. Yeah. and offloading it onto God through lament. That's why the Psalms are mostly lament. So I would strongly encourage people to go into these places where their pain can come up and be kind of processed by the body and discharged to God in prayer. And then the other place I would strongly encourage people to go toward that is a spiritual discipline is deep you know, relationships with other people, mm -hmm. with the one, the two, the three, who yeah. you can just, who can carry, who can, you know, what's the Galatians line, bear one another's burdens. Mm. So James, I'm sure you know this, but James Pennebreaker, famous psychologist, did the first ever, it's now been replicated a thousand times, it's kind of old news, but at the time it was this groundbreaking, paradigm shifting study on trauma where he and his team wanted to study why is it that some people have an experience of trauma and their life is basically decimated and they never emotionally mm. recover. Mm. Like they just, frankly, it's, it's very hard to say, but they just, they never really recover from it. Yeah. And other people um, go through the same exact experience or a very similar one. And often it's horrible, it's evil, but they're way better people as a result, you know, and the whole yeah. concept of mm. post-traumatic growth, which is like right. one of yeah. the strongest things in science right now. Like often people come through trauma and they've grown, they're more mature, more resilient, more joyful, more peaceful, more altruistic, mm -hmm. more grateful. Like they're, they're just better, happier people on the other side of it. Yeah. Why is it? And they went in and they they had a theory. So their hypothesis was, that it was traumas that had social stigma attached to it that people could not recover from. So they specifically looked at sexual assault and they also looked at the suicide of a spouse. So people mm. whose spouses had committed suicide, which no. uh, there's a social stigma around that. You know, I'm not saying it's right, yeah. but there is, especially at the time, yeah. this was done in the 70s, I think. And a couple other things like that. And their theory was, all right, if you go through like the the death of a spouse, there's no social wow. stigma there. But if you go through the suicide of a spouse, there is some kind of social shame. Um, so I think wow. that's that was their theory. Basically, they found that there was z almost zero correlation. They're basically their hypothesis was wildly wrong. And they found there was almost zero correlation between the nature of the trauma and whether or not somebody emotionally recovered or even grew as a result. The mm. one strong corollary they could find was whether or not people had what they called a relational home, mm. whether or not they had close, deep relationships wow. to process the trauma in real time and walk through it. 
And wow. basically, almost wow. no matter how horrific the trauma was, if people had a close community that they were walking with, processing, weeping, lamenting, you know, yeah. crying into their, their tea together yeah. over, then yeah. almost all of those people um, came through the traumatic experience, still with scars and pains wow. and sadness yeah. that often last, you know, lifelong. But they made a full emotional recovery toward mm -hmm. joy and often were deeply, oh, wow. you know, grew as people. So I think wow. th that, is, you know, you don't need to know much of the Bible to line that those findings right. up with the teachings of the New Testament. You know, right. um, they're based, that's just the science behind what the New Testament tells us to do. Mm -hmm. So I think, yes, go, I would, I would pastor people toward places of quiet contemplation where the mm -hmm. pain comes up and the safe mm -hmm gaze of God's love and mm. toward really deep, trustworthy relationships. Mm. That's wow. so good, John Mark. Thank you for that. Wow. Wow. Mm. One of the, um, I'm, I'm going to move us to a slightly different direction. One of the things I appreciate about your ministry, John Mark, I've spent the, I've spent the past year with Gerald May and with St. Teresa mm. and with St. John of the Cross. Love and this Gerald isn't, May, yes. Oh, so good. So this isn't true of everyone in pain, but one of the strange phenomenons, you know, in pain and in grief is sometimes this experience of the dark night of the soul. And yeah, I, I was looking for, honestly, for my own experience to some sermons and yours was one of the only ones. Like, I'm like Googling Dark Night of the Soul. You, <laughs> There's not super, a lot of sermons out there. Not a lot out there. <laughs> yeah. You went Listen. there really bravely. And I, I really appreciate that. I don't know what that says about me. Yeah. 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 It's virtue or vice that I have multiple <laughs> series on the Dark Night of the Soul. Right. Well, I appreciate it. It meant something to me. But um, yeah. for our listeners who maybe aren't familiar with that um, concept, um, could you you know, I know it's a lot, but could you kind of briefly explain what the dark night of the soul is? And for our listeners who maybe find themselves in that season, and maybe it's crossing over with their pain and with their grief, like what in the world do they do? Yeah. And maybe also no, tell me too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, yeah. Does your church need resources in order to meet people in their pain and trauma? Okay. We'll stop what you're doing for just a second and listen up, especially if you're a pastor or church leader. At Nothing Is Wasted Ministries, we are passionate about helping people heal. But the only thing we might be more passionate about is helping your church become an environment where people can heal, which is why we offer our Pain to Purpose course for churches. With the Pain to Purpose course for churches, you will get everything you need for a proven pathway to lead people through trauma and grief and get them back on mission. The fact is that unaddressed trauma is holding back an overwhelming amount of people in your church and keeping them from fully walking into their purpose. This course gives your church body the tools it needs to identify and unpack trauma in a safe environment and apply sound scriptural principles to pain for the purpose of moving through it. Imagine doing all of this within your spiritual community. What makes this course so unique is that the Pain to Purpose course offers a broader, more holistic approach to addressing common denominators of pain, no matter what the specifics may be. With the Pain to Purpose course, your church will have all the tools it needs to start helping people in their journey from pain to purpose right now. If you're ready to see healing take place within the walls of your church, connect with us today and let us show you how the Pain to Purpose course may be the resource you've been missing. You can learn more by visiting nothingiswasted.com slash churches and sign up for one of our demo calls. People are hurting and we as the church should be the first place they can find the tools they need to move from pain to purpose. Let's have a conversation about how you can help your church do just that. Connect with us today at nothingiswasted.com slash churches to find out how. Let me start with the story and then I'll come back. This only makes sense to those that are familiar with what the dark night is. But in my first kind of, actually, I think now in hindsight, I realized it was my second season in a dark night of the soul. The first one I had no language or category for, I thought I was losing my faith. Mm -hmm. um, and I now would interpret it differently uh, with now knowing what I know now. But in the second time I had started reading, uh, Gerald May has a lovely book on the dark night of the soul where he summarizes the work of St. John of the Cross 
and St. Teresa. Dark Night of the Soul is language from St. John of the Cross, 16th century Spanish Carmelite. That's a monastic order. He was a reformer around the same time as Martin Luther and John Calvin, you know, this time of great reformation. He stayed Catholic, but was a great reformer in the church. And his kind of mother in the faith and spiritual director was St. Teresa. And a lot of his paradigm was based on her teachings. Anyway, um, I sat down, I had this suspicion that I was living through a dark night of the soul. I was just learning about this new, it was a new concept to me. So I went, you can't get much great information from evangelicals on this. So I went to a Jesuit priest in town that I knew, and he's a very well respected and trusted older gentleman. And I sat with him at this chapel in this little Jesuit retreat center for spiritual direction. And I kind of was saying, Hey, I've been reading about this dark night of the soul. And I, I think this is what's happening to me. And long story short, he said, yes, this is what's, I think this is what's happening to you too. And then classic type A overachiever that I am. I was like, all right, so uh, Father Rick is his name. Uh, ha- I, I don't want this. I read in St. John that if you don't like respond to what God is doing in the dark night, that either you'll get stuck in the dark night and it'll last, you know, 10 years when it should have lasted okay. 10 months. Right. Or worse, you know, God will take you out of the dark night, but you Mm. won't progress in your spiritual journey. You basically regress and you'll get Mm. stuck in a plateau. Mm. And I'm like, so, okay, I want to go through this, but I want to get through it as quickly as possible. So I was like, what do (laughs) I need to do? (laughs) Yes. How do I get an A++ and conquer the mountain that is the dark night? And I I didn't say that, but I said like, what do I need to do to go through the dark night well and not make it last too long? And, you know, he just started to chuckle and he said, John Mark, the dark night isn't something you do. It's something that is done to you. Mm. And we went on and had a a lovely conversation. But I think similar to suffering, um, it's not something you do. It's something that you, you know, let be done to you. And it's more about our response to things that are outside of our control. So first thing about the dark night, it's language from St. John of the Cross for a phenomenon that all sorts of Christians have been talking about for 2000 years in all different traditions of the church. It is not a synonym for a time of pain and suffering. So sometimes in Mm -hmm. popular English, you'll hear people throw that language around. They've gone through some experience of pain, suffering, like, oh, it's my dark night of the soul. Um, Mm -hmm. It may overlap with the season of pain and suffering, but they are not the same thing because in times of pain and suffering, often people experience God's love and his nearness far more right. profoundly in a season right. of loss, grief, trauma, even than in a season of goodness where they're just kind of busy and yeah. distracted and, you know, doing that stuff. Right. But there are also times when you go through pain and suffering and God feels inexplicably far away or Mm -hmm. absent from your life and you go to contemplative prayer and instead of feeling comforted by the spirit of God is almost like you touch a a black hole of atheism inside of you. Mm -hmm. So the dark night in, in Christian contemplative spirituality is language for seasons of life where it feels like this is again, psychological language, psycho spiritual language, not theological language. It feels like God, the felt sense of God's presence is far away from your life. And God Mm. feels more like absence than presence. Prayer, spiritual disciplines feel dry. Uh, Desert is another metaphor that is used by lots of Christian contemplatives, again, for thousands, all the way in the Psalms. You have this desert used as a metaphor for seasons of life with God, where, you know, like people often misinterpret. I love to teach from Psalm 42 when I teach on the dark night as the deer pants for streams of living water. So my soul pants for you. Evangelicals read that through like youth group revivalist lens. And they're like, (laughs) Oh God, I want you so bad. I love you. I thirst for you. I desire you. And it's like, they're like burning with passion for God revivalist thing. That is not what Psalm 42 is saying. Mm. Psalm 42, the imagery is of a deer in this, like, this is like not America. It's not Pacific Northwest where I was, where it rains constantly. Mm. This is the desert. This is the Middle East. Right, right. uh, Near East. The imagery is of a deer 
in a desert going to a creek or a water source to survive and finding it bone dry. They're thirsty, not because of like a virtue, because they desire water so bad. They're yeah. thirsty because they need water to survive. It's not there and they're dying. Yeah. And there are times when that's what our prayer life feels like. Like we, we are thirsty, we're dying, we're in a desert and we go to God and it feels like the well is bone dry. Mm-hmm. And um, what St. John and St. Teresa and Gerald May and all sorts of people have said is that there are um, there are different explanations for those seasons. Uh, one is you could just be in sin, and sin has a numbing effect on our life with God. Mm-hmm. And uh, or you could just be physically ill, and your body is not able to connect with God in the same way because your brain is in a fugue, or you're on pain meds, or whatever. Yeah. Um, you could be so traumatized that you can barely even connect and commune with God at a a felt sense way. All you feel is grief and loss, but there are, there's another explanation. You could be in a season where God has intentionally withdrawn the felt sense of his presence, which is not his presence in order to And in his first one, uh, what he calls the dark night of the senses is the one that I think most Christians who've been following Jesus for any length of time have been through this. It's a season where you used to go to church, read your Bible, pray, go to a worship service, read a Christian book and feel something emotionally, feel God's presence or, and this is not for all people. Some people are really analytical or disconnected from their body and feelings, but most people would feel something, feel passion, feel God's sense. And then God often leads you into a season where you don't feel much of anything at all. And, uh, and he would say that actually God is weaning you off what we today call the pleasure principle, where Mm. he called it uh, spiritual gluttony is what he called it. But the pleasure principle is where you're, you think you're loving God because God is lovely, but really you're loving God for the feelings you get from God. God makes you feel loved and happy and at peace and hopeful for your future. And so in order to actually grow and mature us, God has to lovingly wean us off of that. Mm -hmm. And similar to marriage, when those feelings go away, there's the chance for us to actually begin to love God for who God is, not Mm -hmm. for the feelings we get from God or the graces we get in our life from God. So, um, and then there's a a more intense one that he called the dark night of the senses. That's more of a Psalm 22, Jesus on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Experience of pain, trauma, where just God, it feels like the universe is utterly black and Stephen Hawking was right. There is no God and you are utterly alone Mm. and you are somehow Mm. participating in the mystery at the heart of the Trinity and the cross of Christ. And so much more could be said about what it's doing. All that to say for your purposes, there are seasons of pain and suffering where rather than feeling closer to God, as many people often do, it coincides with a kind of dark night where you can't Mm -hmm. feel God. You don't sense God. You go to prayer. There's not comfort. You're It's like the psalmist said, the Bible doesn't hide any of this. The psalmist said, I remembered God and I was troubled. So, Mm. you know what I mean? Like that's, that's a prayer in the Bible. Like there are seasons where I go to church and I walk away believing in God less, you know, and doubting more and faith feels more like doubt than like trust. And God feels more like absence than presence. And if you can just hold on Mm. in those Mm. seasons Mm. and just not give up. And just uh, St. John strongly moves people toward contemplation. He, he would just say, 
let your soul, I think his line is, remain in loving attention on God without doing anything much. Mm. Just mm. be quiet before God, be still before God, cling to God in faith, not in feeling, yeah. in trust, and, and just hang on, hold fast, and you will come through it. God will bring you through it. Um, sure. God will bring you through to the other side. You don't even need to do anything really other than just remain in silent attention before God mm. and, and don't give up and just keep going no matter what you feel. Mm. And, wow. um, and God will lead you through. Mm. Wow. 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 John Mark, that's so encouraging. I know yeah, for so many people so. who are experiencing that right now, and mm. there's a whole lot of conversation around deconstruction and people migrating yes. away from their faith. And I know that that can be that dark night of the soul. If they don't have language for it, they don't have, that can be an impetus for that as well. And so I, I know that's mm, absolutely, it's just, it's so, so I think of some friends of mine who have recently expressed to me, like, I just, I feel like I'm in that dark. I feel God's absence. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And it's, it's screaming. It's so silent, you know, and it, yeah. and so I, I just appreciate you really giving us language for that, breaking that down mm. for us. Um, this whole conversation oh, for, the, has been for those that do come through yeah. and I agree, Deacon, that's one of the drivers behind deconstruction, but for those that stay with God through the dark night, your inner life and your life with God, which go together will be profoundly enriched on the other side mm. of this experience. Mm. You know, St. John basically talks about how it brings a spiritual tranquility to you. Mm -hmm. You can go through this, you will feel far less anxious, far less driven, far more just able to just sit quietly with God's love, mm -hmm. far more assured in your inner being of God's love for you. There will be a, a peacefulness and a serenity that comes on the other side of it. It isn't perfect. We still live in a deeply yeah. fallen world and bodies of death, yeah. as Paul calls them. But that um, on the other side, you will thank yeah. God that he brought you through it. You'll never want to go through it again, but you will thank God that he brought yeah. you through it. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Man. Man, thank you. I wish we could sit and talk about this for a couple more hours. My goodness. Oh, this is lovely. Tomorrow. What this a is joy to chat time. to you about this. Yeah, so uh, good. An amazing time. You know, you just recently came out with this book, Practicing the Way. And uh, we didn't even really get into the idea of apprenticeship <laughs> and kind of the stuff that you're talking about with this. But um, it's all this I think stuff. Yeah. all of it's kind of all it's all encompassing. Yeah. You know, it, it really is uh, following, you know, being with Jesus, friendship with Jesus, doing as Jesus does and walking through. I mean, he gave us the best demonstration of walking through the both pain and suffering and the dark night of the soul. And so it's such a good example for us. Where, where can our listeners are those who are watching this, where can they, where do you want us to follow along with what's next for John Mark Comer? Oh yeah. I mean, you could just read the practicing the way book. Other than that, um, the nonprofit we're working on is also called practicing the way you can go to practicing the way.org to find courses, practices, podcast, stuff like that, that we offer all for free. And then uh, johnmarkcomer.com has like all the stuff, all my books and all the work I've done. But yeah. Awesome. It's awesome, man. It's been well, really thank you so much. It's been an honor. Thank you yeah, for the work for you do. No, my joy. Thanks for having me to both of you. And may you survive the Chicago winter. <laughs> <oddly>. <laughs> I will receive and... that in Jesus' name. <laughs> <laughs> He's been faithful in the past to you, Aubrey. He will continue to be faithful. <laughs> oh, to, to quote my buddy Helge in Iceland, winter is a form of suffering. You know, Amen. so Amen. just apply all of your Nothing is Wasted podcast okay. truth and wisdom to winter and get through. And in the meantime, I'll, I'll take my dog on a walk in a t-shirt in Gosh. Southern California and Enough. just cut him off. David, he's done talking. Pity it. for you. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. All right, bless That's you amazing. guys. Honor to meet you Thanks, both. Man.
Hey, well, I told you that was a powerful episode. I'm so grateful to Pastor John Mark for sitting with us as long as he did and as graciously with us as he did to talk through some of the things that God has shown him and some of the things that he's really passionate about. And I really appreciate it because I actually don't think we've ever done an episode on the dark night of the soul. And so I really appreciate that we were able to dive into that concept just a little bit. I told you on the other end that, and I think John Mark said this as well, that we tend to tend to misunderstand what the dark night of the soul is because we sort of like lump it in this general category of, of hardship or a dark season or something like that. But sometimes the dark night of the soul is in the just ordinary days of our lives where we're like, God, I, I'm trying to pursue you. God, I, I'm trying to lean in and be faithful. But for some reason, there feels like there's a block. Like for some reason, it feels like you're hidden from me. What's interesting to me, I think I told you, I have been studying the concept of the dark night of the soul for over a year now, reading a lot of uh, St. John of the Cross, Dr. Gerald May, reading Teresa herself, um, and walking through a dark night of the soul season. On the episode that we did with Davey and um, Eric Schumacher, I talked about how, you know, ever since my best friend Jen died, it's been so bizarre to have the Lord remove a sense of his presence and his comfort for me. And I haven't understand it. I I've sometimes wondered like, am I in sin? Have I done something wrong? Maybe you've related to that as well, where if God removes his presence from you, you're like, did I do this? Am I the block? What's going on? And, and certainly scripture talks about how because of our sin, there are times when God does remove his face from us, but the dark night of the soul is not that it's not punishment for sin. It's, it's not even, it can feel like spiritual regression or spiritual immaturity. It's not that either. It's this thing sort of historically, anecdotally throughout, you know, Christians around the world have experienced when God just removes that sense of his presence uh, in fact, the dark night of the soul is actually translated La Noche Oscura, um, the obscure night, because it's it's really not about darkness. It's about obscurity, God kind of hiding that sense of his presence from you. And, you know, there are ancient writers, the writer of the cloud of unknowing talked about that. Scripture talks about that a lot. Like anytime the psalmist cry out, God, where are you? Why have you hidden your face from me? Sometimes scripture says wild things like that, that there's darkness at the feet of God's throne and, and God hides his way, but we try to find it. And, you know, that phrase is not in scripture, the dark night of the soul, but it certainly is referenced by a lot of the psalmists and a lot of the lamenters. I think even Jesus on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That sense of God's absence. We know that God never forsake Jesus because they're one, like they could not be divided and yet, for some reason, faithful followers of God, including Jesus himself, sometimes experienced a sense of God's divine absence. And I mentioned before, and John Mark Homer mentioned this too, that sometimes God does that because he wants us to worship him for him alone and not for a feeling he gives. The other thing is this. What can happen is we can begin to attach ourselves to what we know about God, almost like we've gotten God figured out right? Okay, God, you work like this. You do this. You fit in this box. And if I do X, Y, Z, then that means you're going to do A, B, C. Like we kind of put God in a, a formula. We try to domesticate and tame God. We, I have a friend, Jesse, who says we try to make God like a, our little tiny doy, toy dog in a purse, but God will not be domesticated. God will not be tamed. And so the dark night of the soul, I think is God's way of going, you know what? You think you understand me, but what you've understood is not God. St. Augustine is famous for saying that the moment you think you've understood God is the moment you've realized it's actually not God. God goes, boom, I'm going to explode out of the boxes you've placed me in to show you, daughter or son, that I am bigger, that I am better, that I am more explosive than you could possibly imagine. And that's part of what the dark night is, kind of like shaking up the scaffolding that we've built around our faith, shaking up the boxes that we've put God in and God going, look, I, I'm bigger than that. I think especially for those of you, Nothing is Wasted listeners, Nothing is Wasted community who are in seasons of darkness, who are in seasons of doubt, who are in seasons of spiritual drought, as John Mark Homer alluded to, who wonder where God is, who are hurting and desperately praying and, and not sensing God's 
voice, not sensing God's presence. I think it's so helpful to know one, you're not alone. You're not weird. Like for some reason, God does that. But what we can, we interpret God through God, right? We interpret scripture through scripture. So we know even in those seasons of, of dryness or darkness or, or doubt or God, you know, seeming to have that divine disappearing act for whatever reason, what we know is that God is always good. What we know is that God is always love and that everything God is doing is for our transformation, for our Christ likeness, and even for the good of others. So sometimes in seasons of um, dark nights of the soul, there's not much more than we can do, but let God love us. And that means waiting. That means staying faithful. That means leaning in. That means being kind to yourself. And that means trusting like, hey, God, God is going to show up here. I believe it. I don't know how long it's going to take. It might take months, might take years, years, but I believe God is going to show up again. I will see the goodness of God in the land of the living as the psalmist cry out. And so for some of you, this is a word. As you start out the new year, as you think about your own dark night of the soul, God is saying, hold on. Stay faithful. Do not walk away from the God who loves you and trust that in the midst of your dark night, in the midst of God's obscurity, he is actually doing something that's for your freedom and your transformation and your goodness and your joy and ultimately your delight on the other side of it. You will have more intimacy with God on the other side of your dark tunnel, but you have to stay faithful. What faithfulness looks like, I think, is continuing to cry out to him, continuing to say, I'm here, God. Sort of like that Canaanite mother in the book of Matthew. She's so desperate for her daughter to experience healing. The disciples are trying to kick her away. It almost sounds like Jesus insults her, although I, I know he doesn't because I know the heart of Jesus. But what she simply says is, I will not be moved. I'm going to stay at the feet of Jesus. And she just cries out, Lord Jesus, help me. That's her prayer. She, she kneels at Jesus. She will not let the disciples drag her away. She will not let anyone else drag her away. And she just says, Lord Jesus, help me. Lord Jesus, help me. Lord Jesus, help me. I think that's, if you're in a dark night of the soul, if you're walking through a, a difficult season where you're struggling to sense God's presence, that's it. Like every morning, get on your face, get on your knees, put your feet on the ground and say, God, I will not be moved by the strength of your spirit, but you have got to help me, Jesus. The promise of scripture is that he will, friend. The promise of scripture, nothing is wasted, is that you are not alone. You will never be alone. And God will return that sense of his presence in a way that you'll be like, okay, I get it now. Thank you, God. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your delight. com slash start here to join our five steps to taking back your story zoom call that is a great starting place for you nothing is wasted.com slash start here we also want to thank sleeping at last for providing all of the music for the nothing is wasted podcast i love his music be sure to download and stream it wherever it is you do that it is good like lament music sleeping at last he's got really good dark night of the soul music be sure to like and follow us at Nothing Is Wasted Ministries. Rate the podcast on Apple Podcasts because what that does, that's kind of your ministry to us. That helps other people find these inspiring stories as they walk through their own valleys. You can follow me on Instagram at obsamp. You can follow Davy at Davy Blackburn, and you can follow Nothing Is Wasted at Nothing Is Wasted Ministries. We have an incredible conversation for you next week, as always. So let's go ahead and take a listen to part of that. In some sense, there he is more glorified by the redemption of something that was broken, by something that was never broken at all. Mm. Um, and and I, I don't want to die on that hill. There may be somebody out there listening who's like, oh, that's heresy. I, I don't think it is. I, 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 yeah. I could be wrong. But, that, but that's what I've experienced. I, I know that I have experienced my own heart growing in grace because of the suffering that I've, I've um, yeah. gone through. So, and that happens to be a, a great way to... To write songs. One one sure. more thing I would say, since you brought up yeah. your friend, uh, is just that um, we also have to be careful to not overshare or share too soon. You know, mm. uh, when you're we're, you're processing your grief, you can't make your audience your counselor. You know, you I, I've been guilty of that. You know, to write a song in the depths of my despair, and then that night I've got a show, and I'm like, I'm going to play it tonight. 
and then things get weird. It feels kind of like, oh, you know, nobody knows what to do. There's, that guy on stage is going through a thing right now, right in front of everybody. Mm -hmm. And that, that's not a good, yeah. there's not, it's not wise. And so Walt Wongren Jr., who's a great novelist who died, or theologian novelist who died last year, he said, he wrote very frankly about his failings in his memoirs about being a pastor. And uh, somebody asked him about, hey, how do you do that? What's the wise way to sh write about your own brokenness, your own failings? And his answer was that you have to wait long enough to see the redemptive arc in your own story before that, that, that story is something that you are now allowed to share. Like, so, oh. um, you know, and I don't think that's a hard and fast rule, but there's a lot of wisdom in that. And like, um, wait, wait until you're talking about the thing in the past tense before you stand on the stage and begin to like hold forth on how it's shaped you. Um, oh. I, I think there's some truth in that. So I've been yeah. guilty of doing, doing it the other way, but I, you know, I know, um, my album, the burning edge of dawn was the one I wrote kind of, uh, coming out of this three year season of depression. And, uh, I was terrified to write that record, but, but by the end of the album, I realized the spring had come, you know, and, mm. and the long mud season was over and I was able to write about it in the past tense. Um. Hey friend, if you liked this episode, be sure to like and subscribe so that you can stay in the loop every time Nothing Is Wasted releases a piece of content here on this YouTube channel.